So folks, I have something that's going to put a smile on all of your wonderful faces this morning. It is a joyous update because surprise, surprise, it is a gargantuan defeat for old Donnie, this time in a high profile Georgia courtroom. And this decision, this single decision changes the game and removes his last hope, his last faint hope of having some way to wiggle out of the consequences that are bearing down upon him in Georgia. And this is connected, of course, to the recent debate around the grand jury because the grand jury has made a massive decision. They've made a historic decision around Trump and around his cronies and around the case, you know, of, of all of those people. But up until this moment, there was a real debate and people wanted it released. Some people wanted this released. And Donald Trump has lost that case. And a lot of his supporters have lost that case. Because fundamentally, what Fannie Willis wanted and she got in this historic victory was the ability to preserve the sanctity of her investigation. I have a few clips to play for you. A couple of them really set up the context over the last couple weeks, this debate, and then we get to some breaking analysis. And I also have some some you know excerpts to read from this legal decision, which is just a bombshell against Trump, and this will explain further why. First, let's start with the fact that Fannie Willis, the, you know, the prosecutor down in Georgia, was fighting tooth and nail to keep this document secret, and the vast majority of it will be and this shows how far she went to do so. Again, ongoing uh, as of right now, Andrea. Another thing I want to point out from what we've heard uh, within this uh, within this, this this hearing is the extraordinary measures that they've gone to keep this report from leaking. Judge McBurney said from the very beginning that he actually hand delivered a copy of that report to the DA's office and he said he believes that that is the only report that's in circulation, the only copy in circulation. So it wasn't digitally transmitted or emailed in any way. He actually took a hard copy there uh, presumably to keep it from leaking out uh, before any sort of decision is made on this. And Andrew, I think we have a little bit of sound from inside the courtroom, if we can toss to what Fonnie Willis had to say. We think for future defendants to be treated fairly, it's not appropriate at this time to have this report released. I, as the elected district attorney, have made several commitments to the public, understanding the public interest around this case. At this time, in the interest of justice, and the rights of not the state, but others, we are asking that the report not be released because you having seen that report, decisions are imminent. So I just wanted to set just briefly there the context that, you know, there was a real worry that this would be leaked to the media who obviously want the story because, of course, it'll generate clicks and interest and, and viewership and all of that, but also that it would be leaked to any or all of the people, Trump included, but also cronies that, you know, big names and small names alike that may be named as criminal suspects and or witnesses in this grand jury report. And because of that, there was a real sense that if that got out, those people could start corroborating even more so. That if there was a sense that they were named or about to be charged or what have you, then that would weaken the ability to do a proper investigation because people could start destroying information, getting their story straight, burying parts of the stories that, 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 that you know, don't have alibis and things like that. This explains it further. Joining us now are Gwen Keyes Fleming, former district attorney in DeKalb County, which is, of course, right next to Fulton County in Georgia, and Barbara McQuaid, former U.S. attorney for the Eastern District of Michigan and now a professor at the University of Michigan Law School. It's great to see you both. Thank you for joining me. Uh, Gwen, let me start with you. Just in terms of, of the things that we learned today, setting the report itself aside and when that may or may not become public, um, the word dangerous um, I, I, we got really stuck on that when we were discussing this as we came to air with the story. Why do you think the DA's office is characterizing a potential release of the report as dangerous? What, is that, what, is, what does that say to you? Well, I can only surmise that she has witnesses at this point that she's trying to protect, not just defendants whose rights she's also trying to protect, but she wants to ensure that as possible witnesses are named in the report, that they would be available and healthy for trial. Uh, and so that is is obviously 
any prosecutor's number one concern is ensuring uh, that the case can proceed with all of the relevant facts. And you need to have your appropriate witnesses to be able to do that. Um, Barb, when we talk about uh, the number of witnesses here, or the, sorry, the number of people that have testified, I'm not a legal expert, but 75 seemed like a lot. How did you read that when you heard that statistic? It does seem like a lot, but what I hear when I hear a number like that is that she has done a very thorough job. I think in a case like this with a lot of different tentacles, you know, there are different aspects of this case. There's the fake elector scheme. There is the uh, statements to the Georgia legislature. There is the harassment of poll workers. There's the tampering with voting machines. All of those different things have a lot of components to them. And so to do a thorough job, you need to talk to a lot of people. One of the things that's uh, challenging when you're conducting a grand jury investigation is you think you have just one more witness and you talk to that witness and they tell you about five more people you realize you need to talk to. And so, you know, the never ending layers, uh, skins of, a, of an onion. Uh, but 75 is certainly a, a big number. Um, and in a state uh, where, um, you know, the the facts are, are relatively confined in contrast to the federal investigation, which involves a number of different states. 75 strikes me as uh, a, a big number, a lot of hard work, but a thorough effort to find out what happened here. And of course, it's an ongoing investigation. Now, Gwen, I know you were part of a Brookings Institution uh, paper that basically looked at the Georgia investigation and concluded there were a number of different charges that could be brought here. Can you talk a little bit about how you're seeing this case and the outlines as we stand now? Again, it's, there's a lot TBD, but what, what do you think is most perilous potentially for former President Trump, for example? Well, and again, that report was based on what we knew in the public realm. So as you started, you indicated that it was very rare that we had this conversation on tape. And as a result of that conversation, as well as a lot of the evidence that came to light through good reporting, uh, my colleagues and I thought there was a substantial likelihood of charges. So like that's like that really demonstrates this is a win for Letitia James, a massive win for James, because she did not want some of the critical information about whether charges are coming or not. And also who's getting charged, who's named and whatnot, because that is vital. If that goes out, it really hurts the investigation and it helps Donald Trump. Part of this is based on also the principle that if you're named in this, it could eliminate your due process. You could be branded as a criminal, even though you haven't had your day in court or even been charged. So there is a potential benefit to people named that they won't get, you know, tarred and feathered in the court of public opinion, even if indictments don't ultimately come. But it's mostly a benefit for the investigator. And this breaks down the breaking news from guys literally 20, 30 minutes ago as I record this. It feels like the American people have waited forever for accountability to come for, among other things, what sound to be the Georgia state election crimes of Donald Trump. Just find me 11,780 votes was the infamous ask that he made of Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger. And we know that there were witnesses who desperately did not want to testify to the Georgia State Grand Jury. Witnesses like Rudy Giuliani, Mike Flynn, Lindsey Graham, and others, and in fact, they fought tooth and nail in court to prevent uh, having to appear before the Georgia State Grand Jury and testify about Donald Trump's alleged crimes. And now we hear that, you know, some of these witnesses, I'm not saying it's the ones I just named, we don't know, but some of these witnesses who were compelled to testify apparently have lied. So what does that tell us? It tells us it's not just you know, the district attorney, Fawny Willis, not doing her job in a timely manner. But it tells us that there are roadblocks being put up by witnesses who are going into the grand jury, who take an oath to tell the truth, and then apparently who are lying about what they know, which I will add could constitute additional crimes for those witnesses like perjury, obstruction and accessory after the fact. So I think this is an important piece of information for the judge to disclose to the American people. So it puts in context some of the challenges the prosecutors are facing addressing the crimes of Donald Trump. And that shows it that that they're only releasing part of the report. The judge didn't give Willis everything, but she's probably actually happy with the part that was released. 
All they're going to release is a general description of the grand jury report, an intro and conclusion, as well as the fact that some of the people lied during their testimony and got caught, and they can explain some of those cases without naming any names. So critically, the report will not include, you know, um, who's getting charged or not, uh, who lied or not, uh, will they be you know, recommended perjury or obstruction charges or not, and that gives the media some sort of window into the investigation, but does not give any tip-off to Trump or his cronies. It reiterates that here. The final recommendation of a special grand jury investigating attempts to overturn Georgia's 2020 presidential election will largely be kept under wraps, the judges ruled. Fulton County Superior Court Judge Robert McBurney wrote in an eight-page order released Monday that there are due process concerns for people that the report names as likely violators of state law, but he found that three sections that do not mention specifics can be related, released later this week. These three portions include the introduction and conclusion, as well as the special purpose grand jury discussing its concern that some witnesses may have lied under oath during their testimony. Because the grand jury does not identify those witnesses, that conclusion may be publicly disclosed at this time. And this isn't to say that disclosures can't happen further, but the point here, guys, is this is a massive defeat for Trump. Because his hope, he didn't really play a part in this, he wasn't really going into court making a scene, but his hope behind the scenes was this would get released. And if he was named, and if Rudy was named, or Lindsey Graham was named, or Sidney Powell was named, or any of these Trump cronies were named for charges, Mark Meadows or whoever, that those people would have weeks, if not months of notice that they wouldn't otherwise have that charges were coming, and that they would use that time to basically destroy evidence and corroborate stories in a way that wouldn't happen in a normal criminal investigation. Donald Trump and his mafia tactics just took a massive blow and Fannie Willis scored a historic victory against him.